now. Okay. Um, yes, I'm really thrilled to have uh, Darisha and Abdullah here um, to talk about their latest works. Really, Abdullah's PhD thesis, from what I understand. Oh. So, congratulations on congratulations, that. Congratulations, uh, Abdullah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I was excited to see this come out. Darisha has been working on HTM stuff for years, and um, and uh, you know, a lot of interesting papers have come out of our lab. And uh, and um, excited to hear what you guys have to present today. So, thanks for coming on. Sure. Um, so th thank you so much Subutai for inviting us and arranging the session. So as you said, our team has been working on HTM for the past seven years or six years now. Um, and we've always been focused more on the HTM hardware. And I think uh, it's great to see Numenta community grow significantly over the past few years. So today's work is primarily going to focus on a recent research article in IEEE Transactions on Computers, uh, which is Abdullah's uh, PhD research work. But before uh, he uh, delves deeper into that, I wanted to give you a little bit background on where the neuromorphic um, systems or the community is at this point, because you mentioned that this is primarily an algorithms or a neuroscience community. So we just wanted to provide that short debrief. Oh, that would be great. Yes. Um, and yeah, so a short debrief on the neuromorphic accelerators and part of this work has been sponsored by Seagate over several years. So thank you to Seagate. Uh, and so this is, as I was mentioning, we just moved to UTSA and we're still setting up this space. Uh, <laughs> so this is our new home in Texas. And uh, you can see Abdullah is right there. And let's dive a little bit into the background on your morphic uh, accelerators. So I, I guess there is no news to this group that there are multiple of applications that can flourish when we have um, AI is deployed on the end platform instead of the cloud. There are several uh, applications that are apt for compute or memory bound deep neural networks. And there are several scenarios where you demand low latency systems for inference. But also there is a new class of uh, interactive real world applications that require dynamic learning capabilities, whether it's the video tracking. This is a fun project well, that was done by the students for a class assignment in my lab. Uh, so uh, you can see that for a lot of these scenarios, you would need um, hardware or systems that can process this kind of interactive or streaming inputs. And a lot of times this data could be unstructured and it is rapidly evolving. So we need, for these type of scenarios, there is a need to identify new compute paradigms that can support, um, for example, in the smartwatch health monitoring, you would need the system to have extremely low form factor and energy dissipation. So in that sense, neuromorphic systems can come to the rescue. So if we look at the original definition by uh, Carver Mead, um, he envisioned that these systems are mimicking the neural processing in silicon. And today the community has moved to a much uh, broader definition per se within this, where a system is either uh, inspired or mimicking the neural processing in silicon. So it is no longer pure mimicking of a neural processing in silicon, which is a lot more challenging. So some of the key features that are representative of these systems are shown in this B plot. You can see, sorry, you can see that um, these systems have, are uh, robust. They can process more efficiently streaming inputs. They can learn in C2 or in silicon. And a um, lot of plasticity, um, whether it's the, based on the devices we are using, based on the learning we have with these algorithms. So there is a lot of plasticity at different levels of abstraction. And more importantly, the driving factor or the thing that excites the community about these systems is that they, they can be energy efficient. Um, so, if we look at the landscape of this as to where we are today, um, so I would say we are really in this first generation. A lot of it is primarily academic and research phase chips that are supporting whether it is spiking version or non-spiking operation with a lot of event-based representation. 
and you uh, some of the chips that are getting a lot of attention recently, whether it's the Intel's Loihi, Pohoki Springs, or IBM's True North, and few other startups have ventured into this neuromorphic systems. And a, a small subset of them can support true learning on device, on silicon. So, but none of these current generation chips are able to solve complex real world problems. If you think of the DNN accelerator counterparts, which are able to solve complex real world problems, these chips are not there still. So we hope that in the second generation uh, accelerators, the, these can address some of these challenges and hopefully somewhere down the line, we would have a pure standalone systems. So what is the challenge then? This is so exciting then. What is the challenge we are facing in the community right now? So I kind of divide it into two uh, main um, sets of challenges in here. So one of the daunting questions for the semiconductor industry or in general for the hardware community is as scaling today in CMOS is entering an uncharted territory we are beyond geometric and effective scaling. We are hitting several walls there, whether it's a memory wall, thermal wall, power wall, and can we even shrink these device sizes further? So um, there is some uh, approaches that the community is thinking of. Uh, so moving away from the geometric and effective scaling, perhaps we think about this in a hyperscaling era beyond 2025. Um, uh, Saif Salahuddin has come out with a very good paper a couple of years back in the, on this front. So maybe the future is where you use these new devices and a lot of uh, embedded and high performance memory with 3D solutions. That could offer some reprieve in the challenges we are facing with the current scaling technologies. But then there is uh, a specialized set of problems for the neuromorphic accelerator community itself, like, you know, uh, customized curve walls, I guess. So we, we have a challenge in one of the critical component within our system, the synapse. How do we realize these efficiently? And how do you really support the plasticity on device, can we support true plasticity on device and can we do learning in silico, in silicon for complex real world problems and, and several others, but I'm just listing the relevant ones for today's talk. So quick question, uh, how, what, what, how do you distinguish the plasticity on device from the learning in silico? Or, uh... um, so in some ways they're intertwined. So I, I kind of uh, connect these two as one grand problem, but yeah. I think um, plasticity per, per se, what I'm trying to say here is like, you know, uh, uh, like HTM is a good example. If you have synaptogenesis or if you have, for example, neurogenesis, this potential synapses, right? The concept, how do you account for that type of plasticity in a hardware system? Uh, uh, I mean, there are tricks in how you do it right now. There are hacks in how you can do it. But if you really want to have that plasticity at multiple levels, whether it's structural plasticity and different types of that, which I'll highlight, how do we really um, achieve that? Whereas learning inherently is like, can we do all the learning on device dynamically? I mean, in a compact form factor, can we do the learning on device? So, I see. So, so there's kind of there's the challenge of the hardware substrate, uh, yes. and then there's kind of the algorithmic algorithmic side of it, and the yes. two have to kind of work together. In exactly. Sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for the synapse, I mean, uh, th there was a there was quite some progress in neuromorphic systems in early '90s or so forth, but. One of the biggest challenges was how do we realize these synapses efficiently? We have like these core functionalities we want to have in a single device. We want to provide a physical interconnect. Uh, you want to modulate the signals and facilitate some type of adaptation or learning. And these synapses need not always be of a certain bit precision when we are thinking of hardware implementation. They need to be able to support this dynamic bit precision. 
So I don't have to tell the audience here about the total number of synapses we see are significantly large in a biological brain and some of the silicon uh, or particularly the neuromorphic chips you see support anywhere from one to 256 million synapses per core. So what is the challenge is like you want to design this unit very efficiently when you have such a large number of these synapses on your course. And if you use a traditional SRAM um, in CMOS digital hardware implementation, this can translate to significant energy and area cost. So for example, um, some of these are not even uh, non-volatile, you know, so you lose the information. Um, so that is not uh, an efficient solution. So this is very expensive if you have to deploy a lot of these uh, synapses on a single core. So the community clearly identified that there is a need to uh, have a synaptic device to scale these neuromorphic systems. Sorry, it's slightly blurry here. So um, you might have heard about these devices uh, from my earlier talks, but one synaptic device um, that has gained a lot of attention in the recent times is the Memristor. So here on the cartoon, you can see on the left is a biological synapse and on the right is a memristor synapse. And you can see there is uh, some similarity where the changes in the resistance uh, state is based on the flux linkage through this device. So if I apply a positive right voltage uh, to this device, there is formation of this conductive filament, um, depending on the type of device you are using, it could be different types of materials, leading the device to a low resistance state. And if I reverse the polarity of the applied voltage, the conductive filament gets dissolved, thus leading to a high resistance. And you can do this both for inhibitory and excitatory synapses, and Abdullah has done some interesting designs around it. Um, so you can think of these ions um, dissipating in here, similar to how the neurotransmitters are released at the uh, onset of a spike and so forth. So there is a lot of these similarities. And um, there are different, as I said, there are different materials and types of memristors. So one that is very popular and one that we have been using on, in our lab is the RERAM device and the right energy is around one picojoule and the cell area is significantly lower than that of the uh, CMOS counterpart. Where F here is the feature size based on the technology node we are using, whether it's 65 nanometer, 45 nanometer or so forth. So there is a uh, opportunity to save area and uh, energy costs by using these type of devices. Okay, that's really good. But then that also brings us into a second set of challenges that you're, uh, I was mentioning earlier. Can we do this, use these devices? That's great, we've solved the problem with the Synapse implementation, but can we learn on device? Can we have these different types of plasticity rules um, associated with the neuromorphic algorithms on device. So, um, and can they do this in, sorry, can, can we do the learning in real time and whether these systems can tolerate noise and variability? So um, that's what Abdullah is going to show with his work, which is phenomenal that the system he proposed is able to tolerate all these challenges because if you look at here, there is a lot of, particularly if you look at this plot where you're trying to um, do a right operation on a device and you can see that there is significant variability and um, for each of these uh, test devices. And that is not desirable. And in some cases you might have your devices actually uh, stuck at a certain value or they're uh, not functioning and what, what do you do in those scenarios? And what happens when there is significant noise in your design? So this is an uh, example where we uh, induce noise in the design. I'm sorry, I don't know why this is happening. Devisha, you're, you're talking about individual memristors at this point, is that right? Yes, individual memristors uh, is what's shown in this here, right here. And then, um, this one is in the, in the context of a network, what happens if there is noise induced in several of these devices? How does the 
performance uh, degrade or how is the performance affected by this type of uh, behavior. So um, in some cases, there is gradual uh, degradation or graceful degradation, but in a lot of contexts, it, it fails. So you need to have some kind of symbiosis between the algorithm and the device or the system architecture to address some of these issues. And Abdullah is going to talk about that. So the idea is, can our understanding of neural processing lead to new neuromorphic algorithms and hardware advances? This is one of the core things that we are trying to address in our lab. And that's where HTM really, the design effort with HTM comes into play. Uh, so we've been working on this since 2014. Um, at least the official designs came out in 14, so it was probably a year before that. Um, so we focused initially on hardware, and then I think one of my students wanted a more mathematical grounded framework on the spatial pooler, uh, James Manad Zaganian. And since then, I think there was a lot of progress on the hardware design. So with that, I would like Abdullah to uh, talk about the HTM design. Would you like to share your screen, Abdullah? Uh, yes. <clears throat> okay. So can you, uh, I believe you need to stop sharing so that I can. I'm trying to do that, one second. Why can't I? Oops. So there should be something at the top. Uh, so stop. Okay. Yeah, there you go, exactly, yeah. So let's see. That was a great intro, thank you. That's very clear. So, you guys see my screen? Uh, yes, yes, right. thanks. So, thank you, Dr. K. So right now I will uh, basically uh, talk about um, the design that we propose for the HTM network. Uh, so let me, this here, okay. So, so as Dr. K mentioned earlier, so one of our goals is actually to come up with a design that is low, that offer low latency and energy efficient for hierarchical temporal uh, memory. Uh, so the so the system that uh, that we are building uh, is biological inspired because it is already based on hierarchical temporal memory, temporal memory, which consider which we consider as a core learning algorithm for our model. So it support on device learning and real time processing. Uh, it is fault tolerant, and the devices that we are targeting uh, uh, for our uh, as like end users going to be the eight devices. So here on the uh, let me try to change to laser pointer. So do you see the laser pointer? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. We do. So here we have the design flow for our project. So the. Uh, so it starts basically, uh, basically by extracting the cilian structure on the algorithmic properties from the biological neocortex. And then the, uh, the design of flow progresses basically by mapping the HTM to a neuromorphic chip. And it ends by deploying uh, this neuromorphic chip on energy constraint platforms such as like mobile devices. Uh, the in the first transition, we have like, I believe a new mentor is focusing on that. So uh, in my presentation, basically I will shed light only on this transition, basically mapping the HTML algorithm to a neuromorphic chip. So the design process started actually back in 2014, as Dr. K mentioned, and there we identify what are the bottlenecks that we have in the HTM. And here I divided into levels. So on the first level, we do have the inhibition. And the reason why I identify, I, I identify inhibition operation as uh, one of the bottleneck operation that we have in HTM because this operation is essential because it enforces the, the, the sparsity in the network, but at the same time, it requires a lot of data movement because uh, many columns in the region need to talk with each other to determine the set of uh, uh, active mini column for, to, that represent our input. And also this operation is so hard to parallelize so one of our priorities were actually was to come up with a circuit that can uh, implement the inhibition uh, without the need for data movement. And also we need to have the pluralism. So that was uh, one of our priorities and we did it in a paper. So we developed a winner take all circuit that will do the inhibition uh, and that back in 2018. So the other challenge which which we saw within this in the our new paper was uh, 
to solve the problem of dynamic structure. So as all of you know that HTML as algorithm keeps evolving as it's learned model of the world and having such dynamical structure is really hard to implement in hardware. So there is approaches you can follow. For example, you can use memory unit uh, to, have, to emulate this dynamical structure, but using memory unit is prohibitively expensive in terms of energy consumption and area. So for one of, uh, so for this reason, we could try to get, so on this work, we came up with a communication scheme that slightly rely on the, on the memory unit and we call synthetic synapses representation. So it had to enable the dynamic structure, but uh, it's heavily rely on random generators rather than uh, like memory unit. So on the second level, we do have a set of operations that require a lot of data movement on compute. And here we identify the overlap computing, permanency tuning, and the segment evaluation. So with, the, with this operation, the problem is not actually with the compute as much as the problem with the data movement. So data movement in hardware is a very costly process if we compare it to the compute. And here I will give you an example. So reading one, like 32 bit uh, uh, from a DRAM, it like costs four to five times order of magnitude if we compare it to perform an ad operation and the, using the same technology. So our goal is not as like reducing the, uh, the compute as much as reducing the data movement. And in order to reduce the data movement, we need to have this shift in the technology as Dr. K mentioned earlier. So for that reason, we switch from the, like using DRAM and SRAM uh, to using emerging technologies such as memory search. However, the process like, uh, not straightforward because by the end we need a number of devices that will capture uh, the synaptic behavior like an HTM. Like HTM synapses is very unique, it's binary in nature and has multiple hidden states. And uh, we need basically a synapse that will exhibit this behavior. And I believe like earlier in 2000, uh, early in 2018, I came across this synapse which exhibit this behavior, the, as a, I mean the physical device. But the problem was the, with the mapping, because by the end, we, we do have a physical device, but in the simulation, we need to uh, do the modeling process. So we, we developed the mathematical modeling and also we developed a, a, like a, what we call like a, a window function uh, for the memory server. And this window function, basically what it does, it imposes a certain linearity on the device as it changed, for example, from high uh, state to low state. So in this, uh, also we start working on the, the synapse uh, formation and here basically, uh, basically mostly on the communication scheme. So as I mentioned, you can uh, like emulate all the uh, dynamic uh, in the network by using uh, like memory unit. And uh, for that reason, for that you can use for example, one of the uh, available communication schemes such as the enhanced address event representation. But for the architecture that we built, for, uh, it requires 72 megabyte just to emulate the, the synaptic connections. And uh, this is too much of memory. And most of these communication schemes actually are designed to, uh, to work for int uh, like inter-chip communications, not like within the chip itself. So for this reason, one of our priorities like in, in this work is basically to come up with a communication scheme that try to rely on the memories and also it used the all, all, uh, like random generators, we call them linear feedback shift register uh, to formulate the synaptic connections. So using LFSRs also give us the advantage that we can uh, do the subsampling, like uh, when we form connection between the cell that active in the current time step and the cell that were active in the previous time step. And also another, it gave us a lot of advantages when it comes like, to the power consumption and area. Uh, Abdul, what's, just remind me, what does LFSR stand for again? So LFSR, Linear Feedback Shift Register. It is a random generator. And uh, I, I know you said this, but I didn't quite understand how the introduction of a random generator um, solved the uh, connectivity problem. I think that's what you're saying. Is that right? So, I, I said that because like, uh, like in HTM, we, uh, like in Inupic specifically, we do not form connection with all the, uh, uh, with all the cells that were active in the previous time step, correct? 
So we need to do. Yeah, we, we randomly sam subsample. Oh, the oh previous this is just a random sub. It's just a random yeah. subsample. Yeah, and because we are using LFSR, we do this for. Is, is that what maybe Subhita, you can help me on this too? Is that what we would call um, uh, the potential pool, or is these the final connected uh, neurons? Uh, this would be for the temporal memory where the each uh, act, when it's learning each active dendrite would randomly subsample from the previous active I state. See. It's just okay. Um, so it's yeah. Um, so so, but that's a learned situation. That's a learned yeah, situation. Yeah, it's not part of the learning situation, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. You, you know, the hardware part's a little bit less familiar for me, so I'm just trying to keep yeah. up with you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they actually, so he's actually doing learning on chip, which is really- Yeah, I know he said that, but I didn't quite catch how. So it's like, yeah. like how did you do that? Because that's a challenge for me, as you pointed out. It's a challenge yeah. for many um, uh, technologies yeah. like yeah, this. Yeah, so is, is this picture showing sort of how one dendrite would connect to the, the cells? To the other cells uh, in the in the temple. Uh, yeah, this is for one cell, but uh, okay. I like I have details like circuit uh, description of all this uh, if you are interested. But I will cover some part of it like in later slide. Uh, but right now, this is just like very high level of what 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 is happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, so this is part of the design methodology that I will cover in the in this slide. Uh, this uh, this presentation. So now I'll talk about the system design. So in the system design, we have uh, three core parts. So we do have the encoder, which basically take all the input data and trans translate into high dimensional binary vectors. Uh, we do have the the HTM region here, and here basically we are doing all the spatial and temporal pooling. And uh, the neural activities that will be generated by the HTM region will be uh, translated uh, into something understandable by a human being. And this is what actually SGR classifier is uh, uh, used for. So the, the, um, the operation of the circuit works as follows. So you present your input here, everything get encoded because the output of the encoder is going to be like high dimensional binary vectors. So we cannot transfer them all like at the same time. So we divide them into packet. And through the router, it will go to the to the region and the process each packet separately. So on the, within the region, we do have the main control unit, and here this one uh, uh, take care of the synchronization between the unit that we have and the and the network, like within the same region. And also, we do have array of processing element, and each processing element has uh, one mini column and uh, all the cell basically that associated with it. Also, we do have arbiter and selector, and these two belong to the, to the communication scheme. And these are responsible basically for regulating the data sharing between the cells of the same region. Because as you can see, like all the cells are connected to what we call uh, a bridge. And uh, it's just one uh, bus basically uh, connecting all the cells. So we need someone basically tell the cells if this is if this bus is a free or not a free, and uh, also want to like someone who regulates uh, data bro broadcasting so that we avoid any sort of collision like in the data. I, I, Abdul, it's, what, just backing up a second, Dave. When you said the encoder, um, it packages it up uh, to. Is that because you don't have enough mini columns to process it all at once? Is that the idea? Uh, no, be, be, because, for example, if, if you take any analog value, okay, and you hear, for example, you encode it into 5 to 12 bit. Yes. If you want to transfer them all together, you need a bus of 5 to 12 bit. Oh, I see. You're just, you're, uh, you're, it's, it's not like you, you, can, you can actually process it in parallel. You just can't transmit it. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's just, just, yeah. just normal, normal bus problems. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. You, but you, you are implementing the full complement of mini columns so they can all operate at the same time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, in, now, in, in that picture, you only showed, uh, you know, um, uh, 16. So I didn't know what, what, if that was the actual thing. This is just a... So, so, uh, so in this picture, of 16, the one that I implemented is uh, uh, 961. Got it. Uh, Thank you. In the column. Got it. Yeah. And that was uh, like uh, enough for me, like to uh, get the network working, at least with the data set that I picked. <laughs> so. Uh, but uh, again, there is, uh, we don't have like limit with the scalability issues other than the power consumption. Uh, so now we talk about the individual processing element. Uh, so 
so this is the mini colon, uh, the circuit that we use for the mini colon. So here we basically look, here we locally formulate all the proximal connections. Uh, it is not memory based, so highly rely on the LFSRs. And, uh, and also the, the inhibition I told you earlier, like it is one of the bottlenecks. So here the, we will do the, all the inhibitions that happening uh, within the region can happen concurrently. And thanks for the winner take all circuit. Uh, that each uh, mini column ha uh, has, and also this, because a lot of operations, uh, so like happening here, like in parallel, such as the overlap and uh, like during the synaptic uh, uh, connection, usually these operations take too much time. And here it's happening in parallel, uh, and this will give us a lot of um, speed up. So mm -hmm. the proximal. A uh, uh, quick question there. Uh, sure. When you. When you the inhibition you're talking about is within the cells in the mini column? Uh, uh, do, so we do have two circuits for inhibition. Yeah. So one, like a, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One, I believe you saw it in the paper, that one we used to inhibit the cell within the, the same, uh, within the mini column. And we do have uh, this different uh, winner take all circuit, which used uh, to uh, uh, select the mini columns. Because here, the one we use here, uh, because in, in the, uh, for the mini columns, you need multiple winners. So you need to use K winner take all circuit in order to select, uh, let's say, 40, uh, 40 uh, mini columns out of 1,000 or 2,000. But in the cell, in the case of the cell, you pick only one. So you need one winner take all, not K winner take all. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, okay, I see. So, so you have the first, so you have one for the spatial pooling process to select the mini column and then one to select the winner within the mini column itself. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. So we have three units here. We have the peripheral unit, and here basically we are formula, uh, forming all the uh, synaptic pathways. Uh, we do have the proximal unit, and here we have the registers, and basically here we are storing the status of the individual synaptic connections, whether it's connected to a, uh, an active bit or it was connected to an active bit. And the strength of the individual synaptic connections uh, is emulated here uh, by using memoristors. So the overlap here uh, is computed also here, and it is sent by the winner take all. So this winner take all exists in every mini, uh, in every uh, mini column, and they are connected together through this dot line. And uh, here on the side, we do have a waveform uh, that's showing. Uh, the process of computing the overlap and how the synaptic changes uh, for uh, one uh, mini column in the software and hardware model. Uh, and here we are showing only two uh, proximal connections, otherwise it's gonna be messy. So, um, so uh, one thing you can observe from the, I mean, there are several things you can observe from the plot. Uh, for example, the changes in the proximal connections uh, permanence uh, is not linear in the hardware model, but it is linear in the software. Uh, another thing you can observe is that all the changes that's happening in the synaptic connections, as long as it's not crossing the threshold, doesn't have any impact on the overlap uh, score like in the software model. In the hardware model, this is not the case. Like either like many small changes like in the, in the conductance can have, can have uh, like impact on the overall Overlap score, but but uh, yeah. another basic question here: You're talking sure. about the the hardware model and the software model. Um, are you uh, is the hardware model a simulation of the hardware, and the software model is like our like a standard HTM implemented in software? Is that what you mean by the hardware model, or is this so the, the hardware, hardware model is the circuit simulation in cadence? So that's it. It's a circuit simulation, is what you yeah. Mean. It is a, it's a, like an industry circuit simulation. Yeah, got it. Yeah, and also because here, like, uh, like, and usually these simulations are very accurate. And also, we are using like uh, technology uh, like uh, PDK, uh, the process, uh, uh, process, uh, uh, process design kit. So these basically, uh, so basically, we are consider all the non uh, non idealities like in the hardware, and all the constraint. Uh, but in the software model, we don't have any of these. Like everything is perfect and magical. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is pretty much uh, what's happening in the mini column. And, and how many cells do you have in a mini column? 
I have four. Four, okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Uh, okay, now, um, so for the HTML cell, so uh, so that so the this so the cell in HTM is fairly complicated because like, as compared to uh, the mini column because a lot of operations happening here are uh, a little bit different and also more complex. But here we uh, take advantage of the sparsity that we have in HTM in order to come up with an architecture that is like somehow relatively simple if we compare it to the digital design. And also it is uh, power efficient. So the, the circuit that we come up with is like at least 20 times uh, uh, more power efficient if we compare it to, uh, to the digital cells. And also because a lot of computations that happen here are- I'm sorry, when you say over uh, 20X, is that over what types of implementations? Like what people so, see? So it? here we do have a mixed signal design. So there is digital unit and there's analog unit. So on the digital on the digital cell, we don't have any analog unit, and we do not use memory servers. Also, I'm just saying. Uh, so this is this is over. This is not over like other people's design. It's not a 20. No, no, no. It is over my design. I do I have like a compared uh, like uh, the full comparison like with other people design in the paper. Okay. Yeah. And even in that, I like uh, achieve order of magnitude improvement in power consumption. If you can, uh, if you look at the paper. And uh, uh, also we achieve a lot of uh, speed up because of the prism, like in segment evaluation, also the way we are tuning the synaptic connections. And uh, so also like similar to uh, the mini column, also we have here like three units. So we have the synaptogenesis where we are basically forming all the uh, distal connections here. And also we have a set of members there, uh, to describe the strength of the individual connections. And here we have a set of current comparators and somewhere basically to evaluate the, the activities that are detected at the segment. Uh, because as, as I mentioned earlier, here we are forming uh, all the synaptic connections probabilistically because we are using LFSR. So there is always a likelihood to form a connection and not to form a connection with the cell that were active uh, in the previous time step. And this kind of like for us, force us to use like big segments in order to always have a high likelihood to form connection with at least with 20% uh, percent of the cell that were active in the previous time step. And, uh, and also we apply the union property so that we can cut out down the number of like the cell segments that we have in the hardware. Uh, so that was pretty much about the processing element uh, in the network. Um, so regarding the arbiter, so as I mentioned earlier here, we, uh, so it is responsible for regulating data sharing among the processing element that we have in the cell. Uh, we didn't use a random arbiter. We decided to use priority arbiter so that we can uh, so have higher channel capacity when we are transforming our data. Uh, and this is the circuit that we used fairly simple. Uh, I can uh, explain if you're interested in that. Uh, because of the time, I will just like skip it. So regarding the results, so we evaluated uh, our design with different data set. Uh, so the one that we reported in the, in the paper was the hot gym data set and the uh, taxi New, York, uh, New York City taxi demand. And uh, in both data set, uh, so our goal was to make prediction for the next and uh, five steps. Uh, and here I will talk about the Hodgin data set. So our goal was, was basically to predict the power consumption for the next two and five hours. And the metric that we used for the evaluation was the mean absolute percentage error. So here we on the side, we see have uh, the measure mean absolute percentage error for both the software and the hardware model. Uh, so, so, in each, so here we are recording the mean absolute percent error, or we are measuring it uh, after presenting 250, every time we are presenting 250 samples. So initially the mean absolute percentage error was really high, but as the network started to get familiar with the pattern, so it started to kind of settle. But we still have this gap between the software and the hardware model. And most of these like, actually attributed to the non-ideologies and the memory store devices and the way probably we are forming the 
the connections with the previous cells, which is, it was probabilistic. And, and what's the difference in the two and the five? So the two is uh, two steps of prediction. Uh, this is- oh, prediction. oh, okay, got it, yeah, yeah. So regarding the latency, so we estimated the latency as the time required to process uh, one input vector after it gets uh, like encoded by the encoder. And here every input vector is, uh, every input, anal every analog input uh, to the HGM is encoded with 5 to 12 bit. And here we estimated the latency for our uh, digital design, which was running at 100 megahertz and our mixing signal design, which runs at eight megahertz. And interestingly, what we found like in all scenarios, like our mixed signal design offer less latency, although it's running at a lower speed. And uh, this gap actually start like get bigger as we scale the network because a lot of operations that uh, having digital design actually have, whether you like it or not, just gonna be like in sequential fashion because of the memory constraint. And here I will give you some example so for example, when you compute the overlap score or like when you are tuning the, uh, uh, the permanence value of the individual synapses. So in the conventional memory, you need to go over the individual value, read it, change it, and write it back. Read it, change it, and write it back. And each, each read or write cycle, at least in the best, uh, in the best scenario, it costs you one cycle, clock cycle. But in the, like if you are using uh, memory cell devices, so these operations can take almost no time. For example, if you're computing the overlap, so all what you need, apply the voltages here and the current that you will collect it here is gonna be your overlap score. And also for tuning, so we developed in 2017, uh, like a training circuit we call JIXA, which uses for the tuning the crossbar structure, for like most of crossbar structure. And these can be used basically to tune the, uh, all the synaptic connection that we have in the crossbar like in two cycles. And so by the end, like in this case, if you have, for example, 256 uh, synaptic connections you know, and you use 8-bit to precision, precision uh, if you compare it to the, to the semi crossbar that use memory, so you can achieve like up to 256 speed up uh, in the computation. Uh, and as I mentioned for the inhibition, also usually in the mixed signal, uh, in the digital design, the parallelism is really hard. So even if you parallelize, you parallelize part of it, part by part. And, uh, but an analog just happening, doesn't take that much happen all at the same time. Which of, which of these two do you think is the, the bigger effect? Is it the overlap or the inhibition, please? Uh, so both, but like in, from different perspective, <laughs> because, uh, because the overlap, like, uh, for example, you need to compare, correct? So even yeah, if you yeah. use it, you need to compare like until like this value with this value with this value and this like uh, is gonna go up, up in the hierarchy until you find the, for example, the 40, uh, for example, the 40, uh, the top 40 winning uh, uh, mini column. Uh, but uh, in, in the case of the overlap, it is mostly, uh, be, uh, because of the memory. Like here is not the problem, in the inhibition, the problem is not a memory problem, but in the overlap is a memory problem because in the memory, you cannot read more than one, like one index at a time. And if you use a dual port memory, you can read two values. This is the best thing you can come up with. Hmm. That latency scaling was pretty amazing. Um, how, how, I mean, are there limits to that? How far can you go to the right? So here I, here I estimated to, up to, like for this, I estimated up to, to, to like having 2,048 mini column. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but could you have 20,000 or 100,000? Um, uh, so you, you can, you can, but, the, uh, but there are a lot of challenges once we uh, start to go beyond these numbers. Uh, but this is problem can be solved uh, by doing what we call a slicing. So in 2000, 18, I believe. So we are proposed, we talk about the slicing in HTM. So rather than having like a huge region where you have like thousands of mini columns, 
you know, so you can cluster every, for example, 2000 mini column and it is associated cell within one region and have like another region next to it. Okay, and this can interact uh, like through, uh, through a router. Yeah, that sounds a lot like our cortical columns. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool. Yeah, and also you can build like multiple chips rather than having one chip. Like each chip have like, for example, 2000 mini column and these two chips can communicate when necessary. Have you actually fabricated any of these mixed signal designs? So I did for the uh, part of it. So we did the fab, uh, uh, we got it last year, I believe, it's okay. Yes, we fabricated the learning component on the Memristor crossbar uh, at SUNY Albany and uh, on IBM 65 nanometer technology node. Um, and uh, it's going through the testing phase right now. And um, in the next year, we are planning to fabricate a full-scale learning system, not necessarily HTM, but we are trying to see if we can get to the next stages of fabricating even the, uh, some of the ideas we have for the HTM. Oh, I'm curious uh, how robust those designs are to PVT uh, variations. Um, so we are at 65 nanometer. I guess that gives us some wiggle room. <laughs> and. Uh, so all those PVT tests, initial tests that are designed looks good right now. And uh, I think one of the things we've done is also kind of having this built-in robustness in the architecture design. So even if there is variability, um, I've shown this in my, one of my earlier slides, there is a lot of uh, variability associated with these devices and based on the type of device, um, the variability could be large or uh, so the, the bounds can be quite varying. So in how you design your architecture and how you are tuning the learning within the algorithm, you could uh, ensure that you can overcome some of these challenges. So in Abdullah's design, I think that is one of the interesting components where he has shown that um, even if you have some stuck at faults um, or some of them not working, um, during runtime, you're still able to achieve um, the performance with very with some graceful degradation. And uh, the 65 nanometer process, I think it's going to be shelved pretty soon. Maybe it will be there uh, for a year or so. But um, I think the process uh, is pretty um, tuned in Albany. So we were, they were able to uh, do this rigorous testing because the devices were uh, went through several generations. So um, I would say they are pretty decent. I wouldn't say they're the best, but they're uh, decent. And um, I think this, for any of these emerging devices, I think, uh, as I mentioned in the earlier challenges, it's very important to think not only about um, how we are going to utilize them to build an architecture, but the the bottom line is that there is a lot of variability and uh, um, lack of um, inherent uh, or, or endurance issues in some scenarios. So how do you kind of take advantage of those instead of fighting against them? So that's the trend that's happening in general in the semiconductor industry right now. Even if you go with pure CMOS, as we are scaling to really small technology nodes, we are seeing a lot of these issues. So instead of fighting with them, how do we embrace it in the design process? Well, that's why I was curious whether you uh, had a process for, I mean, since the marine resistors, their, their ability to uh, uh, switch, so to speak, could be variable, uh, whether you do a characterization to see what they would be and maybe gang them together and pair, you know, low highs together or something like, you know, something to make it more robust, some kind of built-in uh, uh, robustness. Um, so, yes, we did that. Uh, in this specific one, uh, I don't know, Abdullah, are you going to show any of the techniques you use to enhance the robustness? But we did that in some of our uh, other papers and how we are pairing the devices, how we are introducing redundancy in the number of devices we are using. Because using a single memristor is actually um, uh, 
or sorry, the area associated or the cost associated with a single memristor is very low. A lot of the cost associated with these kind of devices is the peripheral circuitry. So, um, so with that, we could actually uh, uh, increase the number of devices you are using to represent a single inhibitory or excitatory operation. So in some of our earlier papers, we did that, like instead of using a single device, we used, we paired up like uh, 10 of them um, for inhibition and 10 for excitatory, that the co overall cost doesn't go up because a um, lot of it is associated with the peripheral circuitry still, even if we super optimize the crossbar. So, um, and, and that one was CBRAM devices, which are highly variable. So we had to, uh, and prob which have probabilistic switching. So we had to use that approach in, in, in that scenario. And in some cases we tweaked how the learning itself happens. We kind of adapt slightly um, different learning rules when we are deploying them on hardware or for these uh, uh, crossbar architectures. Uh, that's how we address in some scenarios. And uh, in other cases, by the nature of the algorithm itself, I think it, it has a built-in robustness. So I think it's a layer approach uh, in a way when you're trying to work with these kind of uh, devices. Hope that- it, um, it, it, it sounds good that you're trying to address it at the device uh, level rather than trying to have something higher level trying to correct. I mean, even though you have that robustness at the higher level, it's, it's good that you have ways of doing it at the, at the lower levels too. Yeah, mostly at the circuit level, we are not device researchers. Our collaborators are the ones who fabricate, right? And uh, okay, these are all the variability. This is the variability you have with this device and all the characterization data comes from them. But then once we have that information, how are we going to work with this system? So uh, a lot of circuit level techniques. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, right. I suppose we're going to you. So just for the uh, so for the device non-ideality, so if we already consider the uh, the variability like in the simulation. Uh, so we consider different types of variability, and also we do the analysis uh, uh, on the, the the failure that can happen that that can happen like in the in the, in the devices. So how how and how it it can impact the network performance, and also we did analysis on the noise impact. Uh, some of these are published, some of them are still uh, not published. Um, so here we uh, did analysis uh, about uh, the estimating the lifespan of the network. So, so the memoristor is great when it comes to the uh, reduction, uh, like to uh, energy uh, power reduction and reducing the latency, but also it has a lot of challenges as Dr. K mentioned earlier when she talked about the variability. So the endurance is another challenge. Usually these devices have like limited life uh, uh, and this is defined by the endurance, like how many times you basically can write to the to the memory element. And for the RAM that we are using, uh, it, is, uh, it is between like the endurance usually between uh, 10 to the six uh, up to, and can go up to 10 to the 12. Uh, so for our analysis, uh, uh, we use 10 to the nine, like right in the middle, which is, which I saw it like in most of the paper, actually the, the, the endurance is 10 to the nine. And uh, my goal here was actually to estimate the lifespan of the network. And what I mean by the lifespan, what is the point at which that network will stop learning? Because we are, we probably lost the, the memory store devices uh, capability for changing. And for the, for the network that we use, which has 961 mini columns, so so the life of the network can go up to uh, like eight years, but over time you would expect to you to lose some of the mini columns. So when, some of the mini columns will become inelastic, so they lose co their capability basically for learning. Uh, but if we compare and here our estimation based on the fact that we are doing learning every 10 millisecond, uh, but again. And this life scan can be increased if we can uh, increase the size of the network. And if we are comparing with conventional uh, network, with, which lack the sparsity, uh, like in the connection and uh, the activation, so we achieved like almost 24 times improvement in the, in the lifespan. Uh, yeah, I mean, in some sense, uh, uh, this is 
you know, 10 milliseconds is a very fast kind of sampling rate. Uh, if you look at most kind of edge sensors and things, it's often a lot slower than that. Um, you know, in the hot gym example, I think yeah. we got data, you know, once a minute or something. You know? Yeah, um, for the hot gym, yeah, just, uh, but I mean, I was like, uh, we want to expand the, the applications or. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. So for example, in the medical, like an instrument, I believe it's gonna be like less than, like gonna, I believe this number probably will make sense. Oh, okay, yeah, for medical, I can see. Yeah. Um, let's see. I, I believe this number also can be improved, like if we find a better way to like uh, apply the boosting, because the boosting factor will basically regulate how the we are activating the new columns, like uh, in the network. Uh, so regarding the power analysis, uh, so the average power consumption for the network that we built uh, was uh, twenty nine forty point uh, three eight milliwatt, and uh, it is around. It was like to order of magnitude saving if we compare it to the digital design. So here we have uh, a plot that show um, like an estimation for the power consumption uh, as uh, we move like in the time. Uh, so here we, when we started, for example, uh, uh, forming, forming the proximal connection in the network, the power consumption was really small. Uh, but once we start to compute the overlap score, so we have this abrupt increase in the power consumption. And because here all the mini columns basically are computing the overlap, uh, probably we need to find another way to reduce this, like rather than like computing the overlap of all the mini columns at the same time, like divide them into sessions or find another, another way around that. So here, because the training uh, is limited only for the active mini columns, so we have this small spike in the power increase. And then when the cells start to involve in the computation, we have this increase in the power consumption. And this is because we start to, this increase happening here is because of the use of the distal segment. Here on the side, and uh, this is all for the uh, IBM 65 technology node. Uh, for the energy delay product, so here we have the energy delay product um, of the as a function of the network scalability in terms of the number of cells and the number of mini columns. So we do have like some sort of sharp increase in the energy consumption as we increase the number of cells because of the cells complexity if we compare it in the with the mini column. However, this plot is going to be beneficial for the people who want, for example, to use HTM for edge devices because based on the network. Uh, uh, size, you can easily like estimate the energy delay product of your network, at least for the used technology. Uh, so here uh, we are showing the roadmap that we follow basically uh, uh, to reduce the latency and energy efficiency of the network. So HTM as algorithm uh, gave us really a lot of advantages when it comes to reduce data movement and arithmetic operations complexity because it offers like uh, local learning. So we reduce the data movement, but still we do have data movement within the cell or the mini column, at least. Uh, the sparsity uh, in neuronal activities and the connections also help a lot in saving a lot of memory. And, um, and also we do have like low precision arithmetics and most of them are binary. And that was great, but not enough, unfortunately, to build a system that we can use it on edge devices. And usually these de devices have very limited or tight power budget. So our goal is to reduce the memory access within the cells and mini columns themselves. We want to increase the memory computing. And also we want, because we have like many cells and many columns, most of them are not used in the, in the computations or we are using part of them every time we are, uh, uh, the network is involved in particular computation. So we want to have like kind of event driven unit. And this is what we capture. Most of these we captured like in our design. So we had the memory computing when, because we use the memory store devices. And also we reduce the data movement of 44 times. Um, and uh, if we compare it like to the digital design, also we were able like to shut off uh, some of the, or turn off basically some of the unused unit. So to cut down the power consumption. Summary, so I, I present an overview of the of uh, memory store based mixed signal designs, mixed signal HTM architecture. So the design that we talk about uh, offer server plasticity mechanism 
uh, such as synaptogenesis, neurogenesis, and synaptic uh, plasticity. Some of them I didn't talk about it, but uh, I can share you the paper that talk about this mechanism and how we um, went over implementing them. So we had like a continuous uh, in-situ learning, and also we demonstrated our architecture on the spatial and temporal information processing. So for the system evaluation, so we had like increase in the latent, uh, decrease in the latency. Uh, so our design was three times faster compared to pure CMOS implementation. And, uh, and if we are running them both at the same speed, probably this number will be doubled like several times. Uh, for the energy delay products, so for our des design, it was 4.3 uh, to, to picojoule per second. So we observe also reduction in the performance. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, that's because of the non-idealities that we have in the device uh, that we use, and also because of the way we are forming uh, uh, synaptic connections. And also when we talk about the elasticity, which I show you that the network can have like eight years of lifespan, assuming the learning uh, occur every 10 millisecond. Uh, so a lot of people actually, uh, since we started working on this, uh, a lot of people we had like within, within the lab or also the lab actually contribute uh, or made this work possible in a way or another. Um, so I would like to acknowledge all of them. Um, and thank you so much. And please, if you have any question. That was a great talk. Thank you. A lot of work went into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, thank you. That was that was really great. Uh, is there anything else like this out there? Um, uh, I mean, now uh, you have a chip that you know can really be at the edge. It's super efficient. Uh, can learn continuously with streaming uh, data. What else is out there like that? So, to the best of our knowledge, or at least my knowledge. <laughs> So this is the first one that captured all the aspects that we have in the HTM because all the previous, like at least we are talking about the mixed signal design because all, all the previous mixed signal design implementation of the temporal memory, it's based on uh, the, uh, they call it um, uh, the matching process. So they have like, they store like, uh, they have like a map and they compare the incoming data with like a storage and to see if there's a match or there is no match but it's not capturing uh, the mechanism that uh, the HTML algorithm is actually has. At least uh, that's a point. Yeah. Uh, you know, but you, even thinking really broadly in the field of neuromorphic computing, you know, Darisha, you kind of started out saying that, uh, you know, it's been, uh, it's been hard to kind of cross that chasm over to where the GPUs are and, uh, and so on. I mean, this seems to be, now you have a system which could potentially do that. Is there, yeah, and, and it could have significant advantage over, over the existing solutions. Yeah, I would say still this is a academic effort, right? So sure, them, sure. a lot of practical aspects that uh, have to be still considered. Um, I think uh, Intel's uh, Loihi or Pohoki uh, Springs is doing some of those um, learning on device with streaming inputs and both with spiking and non-spiking scenarios. And I think uh, there is- uh, But I, I don't know if they have a powerful enough uh, continuous learning algorithm though. Um, not a continuous learning. Yeah, that is not uh, shown yet, I think, but there was uh, some demonstrations of how um, it can learn from fewer samples and so forth, but I, I don't think we have like a full scale continuous learning algorithm. And, mm -hmm. and, and in general, right, the research in continuous learning algorithms or lifelong learning algorithms is itself in an evolutionary phase, right? Not, there aren't a lot of them out there. And I think, uh, so I think taking this baseline with HTM gives us an advantage in that sense. Uh, for Abdullah's research in building off of that. But yeah, we haven't, I think there is interest, but I think the efforts are a little sparse right now or um, that we have small blocks of it developed, but not really a full scale system. Mm -hmm. I think that's obvious. I mean, it is it's still an academic exercise, but it's, it's a very important academic exercise. And, you know, it goes back all the time to back when Carter Mead started this, which was what, in the 80s or late 70s? I don't remember that was. But um, I think, you know, the, the research community at large is trying to, would like to know, there's gonna be an end 
any sort of design paradigm for um, uh, you know really whether it's edge or not there's going to be an end paradigm for how intelligent machines are built and, and we're not even close to that today in the world um, and so you know I, I think you're really pushing the edge here on many many fronts um, and it's impressive even though it's not a commercial product and neither is the algorithm really a commercial product um, but it's still pretty impressive. I have, a, I have a specific question for you about this. It may be obvious, but it's a, it's a stupid thing, but I just want to ask it. As you go through the designs, you're simulating this on these, these hardware simulators. Do those hardware simulators um, take into account all the routing issues that you would have to do in a real physical um, implementation? And so that everything you've done is physical buildable or do they, or are you skipping that and saying, well, if I had all these components, and if I could hook them up this way, then it would work. Um, I think it's a mix of it, to be honest. I mean, I would make a bold claim if we say <laughs> we addressed all of it, right? Uh, but well, you could say that. I'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think definitely uh, that is one of the bigger challenges as we are scaling up these systems. And um, I think uh, in the earlier architecture, Abdullah was showing like we have used some H3 models in try in terms of kind of uh, transferring this data to different um, uh, cells or different units. But um, I think in a lot of academic efforts, uh, and this was, I think, uh, goes back to quite a, a few years, what we see is like the assumption that the data is already available to you and then mm -hmm. what you're doing with it, right? Somehow the data is already coming in and then how are you going to move it around so that there are two challenges the data movement cost is what's happening within the chip how you're moving that you don't want that to be uh too high because it's expensive so yes there are um uh, architectures that address that but in a lot of contexts that front-end cost of just taking the data in is not accounted for and what is the circuitry you would need to kind of uh, yeah. Well, it, I always felt that in the end that the sort of routing problem is going to dominate the large systems. Um, I don't know if that's true, but I've always just suspected that. Yes, and in general, with these architectures, routing is challenging. I think that's why uh, people are looking at a lot of NOC network on chip kind of models that they've used yeah. in different contexts. And, and it gets much worse with the kind of uh, dynamic. Uh, architectures that you know uh, synap synaptogenesis leads to, and, and, and a number of connections. You know, real neurons have thousands of connections. And, yes. I mean, this this is really puzzling problems. You know, and one of my criticisms of, of a lot of people who worked on MRISTERS in the past, but they've always, for the, at least for many years, I, ha I don't keep up with your field, but for many years, those those efforts were really isolated. Like, oh, let's just get the MRISTERS to look like a bunch of you know synapses on something without building anything that's really system wide. Um, uh, yeah, I does something. Yes, yes, um, uh, yes. The community has come uh, far along since then. Uh, but again, there is like right now hundreds of devices you can choose in memory stores, different material stacks, yeah. and so forth, and each of them comes with its own set of challenges. But people are starting to build small scale uh, systems with it now. So uh, mm. there is some demonstrations, but still there's a long way to go um, yeah. with this, yeah. Can I comment on this? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your, answer, your question is great. However, this is, I mean, you have to consider the routing uh, problem, but this is the case if you are really having a physical connection. But in our design, we don't have physical connections. So everything is virtual connections. So we don't yeah. have to worry much about the routing, at least for but, the- But the network connections can become, I mean, these, these are still on chip network connections, right? Yeah, I mean, we do have, I mean, definitely there are like a lot of connections going to be there. Uh, for this reason, when Sobutai asked me about like scaling this, I told him rather than having like everything clustered in one region, we divide it into slices. So every sub region will be uh, either like by itself or like can be, we can have it on a separated chip. Yeah. Yeah, but the, uh, the routing is mainly, uh, this is something to worry about only for, uh, for, the, for basically connecting the main uh, unit that we have in the, in the network, but not like for forming or like removing connections because all these actually are formed uh, like in a, in a synthetic matter. 
It's not like there is a, phys a real physical connection. So. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, uh, I understand, but that, that network routing still gets very complicated. Yeah, but, uh, so the, the only thing that I consider for the for the routing is the uh, is the is the edge bridge, which I which is the biggest one, and uh, I added like uh, like a resistor, a capacitor to consider how uh, the propagation of the signal, how it would be impacted as we move data. For example, uh, if, we, if I go back to here. Uh, you see, I believe my slide uh, on the side. So the biggest challenge basically when we receive the packet from the router and you need to broadcast it. So things will go from the, from the main control unit and go to all the cells that we have. And because we do have a lot of plastics and like in the wire, like resistance capacitance. So we would expect the signal to be, to be affected. However, the great thing about HTM because all the things that are digital like digital, like the, everything is represented digitally, so this make the impact of noise really low. It's yeah. not like, yeah. So this also like, but again, the, in my case, I just did analysis for the H H three. Yeah. I mean, in the end, you know, if we if we could jump ahead fifty years from now, and we see how how these systems have implemented, there's a there's a huge number of uh, challenges that you guys have faced a lot of them in your work that yeah. have to be dealt with. And again, I must say how impressive it is how many you've dealt with. <laughs> I think it's really impressive. Um, but uh, it's, and so I'm always trying to imagine what it's gonna be like 50 years from now, you know, what, what will be the architectures? And right now, there's so many different parameters, so many different ways of going about this, so many different ways of implementing these things. It's, your head can spin at times, at least from the outside, looking in occasionally into your, into your world, that's what it looks like to me. Maybe it's all clear to you, I don't know. <laughs> but, I, I mean, I but, think there needs to be drastic shift, paradigm shift in, in the computing architecture domain. Yeah, and, and, and on, on the algorithm front, we're going, you know, we're, we're, what you've implemented is just the tip of the iceberg. Yes. I mean, you know, we're now working on these full cortical column models that are very sophisticated compared to what you've done already. And, and, um, and, and so there needs to be sort of an architectural paradigm that, that comes out of the kind of work you're doing, which can scale to the very varied um, the different, the new, the new pieces of the algorithms that are going to have to be in there. I mean, a cortical column is a very sophisticated thing. We, and if you're following our work, we now understand that they have these reference frames and grid cells and I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff that's going on in them. Um, and we're going to understand all that not too distant future. Um, and so, you know, so I look at your work as like, okay, can it, can it, it, it flexible enough to scale to those type of new algorithms uh, that are coming come out, which are going to be very, very complicated They're like HTM sequence memory, but you know, times 20, you know, yeah. and so but, um, but in some sense, you know, what you have here is a, a really efficient implementation of a pyramidal neuron with active dendrites, you know, with inhibitory systems and so on. So those components would still be part of this much larger model. You yeah, know, maybe that's the right. Exact, that's right. You know, exact that's algorithms right. so and the impressive. connectivity is, yeah. I think that's why it's so impressive. And that's why I jumped to the next question. Like, okay, well, what I've had a whole bunch of different ones like that, you know, hundreds of thousands of those neurons in the cortical column, or hundred thousand or tens of thousands. And they have slightly different algorithmic relationships to each other um, to implement all the things we know that they have to do. Um, well, how much of this kind of architecture can be preserved in that uh, future uh, design? And, and, and so, you know, whenever I look at any neuromorphic computer architecture, I always ask that question. Like, not, not, not what is it doing today, but How's it going to fit 50 years from now? And you know, I don't know. No one knows the answer to that question. But I feel like when you try, when you're trying to deal with a whole series of different issues at once, like you are, that you're getting closer to the truth than than just focusing on one thing like power consumption or one thing like you know um, latency or whatever. Um, yeah, I think what, sort of sophisticated architectures with a base unit, uh, like Subit said. So, um, anyway, it's very exciting to think of look at it and think about. Even though I, it is academic in some sense, because so is our work at this point, <laughs> at least the, the, the neuroscience side. Yes, I think keeping it modular, I think we had this discussion with Subutai almost a year back or two years back, when is the right time to design HTM hardware? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think keeping it modular, uh, keeping it flexible enough so that it can support these heterogeneous units or learning units is very important. And in some, some way, we tried our best to do that. Um, so whether it can, 
and, and as uh, Subhuta rightly captured, the core components are uh, there, which can easily be uh, used as uh, you have um, new modules. But I think even the, um, some of these architectural framework as well can be preserved and have um, new modules added, yeah. even at that level of abstraction. But, but I'm not saying it's going to be a smooth sail. Yeah. No, but you know, <laughs> someone's got to do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> the neuroscience research isn't smooth either. So just so there. Uh, more more grant applications to write. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know where where I'm coming out recently. I we haven't really published this and, and talked about it too much. Uh, we talked about cortical columns in our recent work, and, but you know the, the actual neocortex is built up of these mini columns. Mm -hmm. And we and and you implemented the minicom, but we didn't. We only implemented like one layer of cells in the minicom. Um, and uh, a true minicom in the neocortex is about 120 neurons, roughly. Um, and I'm beginning to I'm beginning to develop a theory about exactly why why the, what the minicom does, what is its functional role, how to understand it. And this is what Vernon Mountcastle proposed uh, 40 years ago. That really the uh, the algorithm, the repetitive unit in the cortex is a mini column, and you take several hundred of those, and then you have a cortical column. Um, but that it's really the mini column, and the mini column has about you know as I said 120 cells, and I and I'm coming to believe that uh, that's going to be the the computational unit um, uh, of these uh, something that's the equivalent of those in the future because we're starting to understand what exactly what they do, and um, and so that's encouraging because it says that. The thing we have to build a lot of isn't 10,000 neurons. It's actually something that has 120 neurons. It's still damn complex. It's really complex what that thing is doing. Um, but that, that becomes your basic repetitive unit. And then you have to figure out how to put 400 of those together or 500 or 1,000 of those together to get a cortical column. And, you know, basically, you know, um, you know, hundreds of you know, millions of them together to get, um, to get a brain. Um, I'm just passing that on to something to think about. Uh, so I, I, there isn't there's a light to the end of the tunnel, and it's not gonna, it's just not going to get com more complex over <laughs> forever. <laughs> I, I'm always optimistic, and I don't think we're too. We're, we're, I think we're through within a few years of actually really understanding this thing completely, um, and then you'll have a better target to shoot for. Cool. Thank you so much uh, for coming. <laughs> Yeah, virtually yeah. coming. <laughs> and, and so, Dula, this setting, was yeah. this was your PhD thesis, is that what I? Uh, this is two chapters of my thesis. My, oh, two my chapters. Thesis, eight chapters. <laughs> it's a small oh, oh my gosh! So you're, it's four sorry. times more than that. Wow, wow that's impressive. I said, are you are you done? Or are you still got like more more time? On it? Uh, I I am trying actually to defend uh, hopefully in September. Hopefully. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And then, do you know what you're going to do after that? Uh, I uh, will go back to my job. <laughs> what was that? So I am a faculty member uh, back from like the University of Baghdad. So oh, I didn't know. I'll go back teaching. <laughs> All right, I'll come back, I'll go back and bring this to other parts of the world. Then. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and uh, we look forward to further discussions. And yeah. all the best with your book, Jeff. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm, uh, yeah, and thank you about that. Anyway, thank you for coming. It was great, uh, great presentation, both of you. So uh, much appreciated. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, thanks guys. Thanks. Have a great day. All right, we'll see you again. Thank you.